Thank you. And now the President of the Republic of Indonesia, His Excellency Dr. Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, will now deliver his remark. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here with all of you tonight. I wish to thank the World Resources Institute, World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, and the Business Council for international understanding, for organizing tonight's gala dinner. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to my good friends, the Prime Minister of Timor-Leste, His Excellency Sanana Kusmao. I am also pleased to see Australia's Foreign Minister, the Honorable Bob Carr, joining us tonight. There are many interesting events going on around town tonight, but you are here. <laughs> I appreciate that. I had a wonderful time listening to the speeches that we have heard tonight. This is indeed a night of celebrations, a celebration of our friendship a reaffirmation of our partnership. Therefore, I accept with humility the Valuing Nature Award for Indonesia's leadership in the Coral Reefs Triangle Initiative, presented by the WWF, TNC, and World Resources Institute. And I humbly accept the economic achievement of the 21st century presented by U.S. ASEAN Business Council. I see this award as words of confidence for Indonesia, a recognition of what we have achieved and what we aspire to achieve. Ladies and gentlemen, every leader in any country faces one and the same basic question. How do we bring progress to our people? From day one of my presidency, this has been my highest priority. For me, the past eight years of my presidency has been a constant process of learning and adaptations. I came to office as an ex-general turn minister, turn politician, and learn economics along the way. When I began my term in 2004, my priority was to reduce poverty, fight corruption, improve governance, and speed up reforms, which is my view was in danger of getting stuck in a comfort zone. Appropriately, my development strategy stood on three policy pillars, pro-growth, pro-job, and pro-poor. But every leader must learn to adapt. Soon enough, I found out that the elephant in the room had to be acknowledged, the environment. This issue became much more obvious when we hosted the historic UN Conference on Climate Change, or COP13, in Bali in 2007, perhaps the largest UN convention ever held to that date. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that we needed a better integrated approach to both the economy and the environment. This, in my view, is a key lesson in governance, the need to be open-minded and to constantly think outside the box. 
As leader, it is not my business to cling to an idea. I reach out for result and for what is best for my people. One moment of revelation came to me in September 2009. It was reported to me that climate negotiations between developed and developing countries had grounded to a halt. Neither side wanted to move to set their own credible and ambitious emission target. It was a frustrating waiting game, and it seemed no one wanted to break ranks and make the first move. I am not an expert in the intricacies of UN diplomacy, but perhaps that allowed me to step back and take a fresh perspective. Of course, we all believe in the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respected capabilities. But I have always thought that in terms of climate responsibility, Developed countries must take the lead, while developing countries must also do more. At that moment, I was deeply concerned that each of the two sides was digging itself into a hopeless trance. I therefore instructed my officials to find our own emission reduction target without waiting for progress in the negotiation. We came up with the 2641 formula that we would reduce emissions by 26% by 2020, relying on our own means, our own resources, and 41% with international sport. It was a risky move and potentially unpopular, but the unilateral announcements of this 2641 Pledge eventually became a game changer. Soon after, other major developing countries announced their emissions emission target as well. I was not trying to lead a cavalry chart. I was just trying to be constructive, and happily, it worked. Thank you. The need to think outside the box and take risks, calculated risk, was also evident in our recent decision to suspend cutting down of trees in primary natural forests and the use of peatland, widely known as the moratorium policy. The, thank you. The adoption of such a policy does not win popularity contests. It may interest you that democracy is not necessarily synonymous with sustainable forestry. <laughs> in fact, the worst period of deforestation in our country, when we lost 3.5 hectares of rainforests, I should say 3.5 million hectares of rainforest occurred precisely during the height of our democratic transition in 2000. We have been able to significantly reduce our rate of deforestation since then. We have been able to meet the challenge of delivering an effective and long-term national forest governance a governance that would provide better support for local communities, benefit future generation, and a governance that reflects the notion that the fate of this forest, which functions as the lung of the planet, should also be a matter of international responsibility. That is why I decided to break new path by working together with Norway to bring into rea reality the concepts of Red Plus. Again, this was not a popular move. I was criticized for it, which I took in good spirit. But I knew it was a necessary decision 
for the long term, and it was consistent with our national interests and environmental obligation. I managed to bring the governors of key forestry provinces on, on board, secure their commitment, and negotiated a fair deal with Norway, who agreed to provide up to $1 billion for this project. Today, we have a, a standing moratorium that would give us the opportunity to seriously engage in forest and peatland governance reform. And today, approximately 35% of Indonesia's tropical rainforest is permanently designated for conservation. Thank you. In the meantime, we are aggressively implementing reforestation. And I personally led a national tree planting campaign that succeeded in planting one billion trees per year. So far. So far, some 3.5 billion trees have been planted. That is, that's almost one for every two person on the planet. How we got deeply involved in this kind of environmental activism is a story by itself. Let me tell that story now. I have now pursued a development vision of sustainable growth with equity. The rest on two key as I should say, this rests on two key elements. The first is the need for growth with equity, and the second is the imperative of sustainable development. Why growth with equity? Well, the Indonesian economy has been doing on a steady upswing. Our GDP growth has continued to climb up, except in 2009 during the financial crisis when we grew by 4.5%. This year, we project to have the second highest GDP growth in Asia after China at around 6.5%. We are now the largest economy in Southeast Asia and the 15th largest in the world. We aim to be in the world's top 10 largest economies in the coming decade but we are not going after growth for the sake of growth. I want to avoid growth that leads to exclusion, marginalization, and resentment because that would be a dangerous growth. I want growth that reduce inequality and empower the poor so that they will rise out of their poverty. It must be growth that spread prosperity create jobs and economic opportunities for the rural and urban poor so that they can live in dignity. Equity is really about justice. A society that loves fairness and justice must strive for equity. That is the only way we can imbue our people with a sense of shared destiny. Economic growth and justice must therefore go hand in hand. They must reinforce each other. The economic process must be inclusive enough to include as many actors as possible so that no one feels left out and no one feels aggrieved and unjustly neglected. But soon enough, I realize that growth with equity cannot endure if it is attain at the cost of environmental degradation. This is why when some say Indonesia could one day reach 10% growth, I say, perhaps, but at what environmental costs? It is not worth it, and that's what I say. We, <laughs> thank you. We must create and distribute wealth without diminishing the bounty of our natural environment. In that way, we can meet the needs of the present, 
without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. A key part of sustainable growth with equity is recognizing that the serious climate and environmental problem that planet Earth face are not imagined. That is why we need to refashion our lifestyle so that we live to meet our need, not greed. On that basis, to the three policy pillars of my government, pro-growth, pro-job, and pro-poor, I added a fourth, pro-environment. <laughs> Strangely, there are still those who ask the question, is it possible to strike a balance between growth with equity and sustainable development? I say it is not only possible, it is an imperative. Yes, we can strike that balance. We can achieve sustainable forestry while still improving the livelihood of the rural poor. We can maintain the trajectory of global economic growth while reducing global greenhouse gas emission. We can harvest the renewable resources of our ocean and seas while conserving their biodiversity and protecting their pristine integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, about our oceans and seas, people often forget that they form the larger part of our planet. That is why I am so pleased to have initiated and nurtured the regional collaboration called the Coral Triangle Initiative. They are known as, uh, thank you. They are known as the Coral Triangle is magnificent. Indonesia alone has many seas in that area, the Arafura Sea, the Panda Sea, the Celebes Sea, and the Halmahera Sea. Its treasures of biodiversity and the chains of ecosystem is simply immense. It is so breathtakingly beautiful and bountiful. It has been celebrated as the Amazon of the seas. Our people fish, swim, sail, and play in these amazing waters. Our way of life and our culture and values are all about Mother Earth and its wondrous ocean. We cannot help but admire and love it. What we often forget is the responsibility to protect these seas and the uh, riches in it. More significantly, this is an area that is critical to the livelihood of the peoples in our region. It is, it is estimated that some 120 million people are directly dependent on CTI areas for their food security, and this has been the case for generations. It is where they make a living and make their way of life. And yet it is an area that is under various threat to environmental and economic sustainability. It is being overfished. Human irresponsibility has resulted in the rapid destructions of its coral reefs. Marine life cycles within it are being disrupted. It is therefore critical to get the economics, I should say the economics and the ecology right in the city I area and to do it in time before it is too late. That is why I did not hesitate to initiate and promote city I in 2007. We work with all sides to build it brick by brick so that this great idea can become an intergovernmental policy leading to regional collaboration. I knew it would not be a hard sell because no government would want to see the degradations of their marine and coastal areas. So we got the ball rolling at the APEC summit in Sydney in 2007. The CTI was recognized in the APEC Declaration. After the APEC summit, 
we can win the World Ocean Conference in Manado in 2009 and produce the Manado Declaration. Six countries took part in this milestone event, milestone event for the CTI Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Timor Leste, and Solomon Island. This Manado Declaration became the basis of for establishing a regional mechanism for coral triangle initiative on coral reefs, fisheries, and food security, now known as CTI, CFF. We now have an interim regional secretariat. The next move will be to make it a permanent one. This will come after every CTI country has ratified the process. Indonesia is now in the process of ratification. We urge other CTI countries to accelerate the ratification process. In the same way that we have committed ourselves to reducing our greenhouse gas emission, we have made a national pledge to achieve 20 million hectares of marine protected areas across the country by 2020. At this moment, Indonesia has already secured 13.4 million hectares. When Indonesia hosts APEC next year, we look forward to the economies on the Pacific Rim defining how to facilitate trade in a way that sustain and improve the bounty of the largest ocean on the planet. The lessons we have learned and continue to learn through the Coral Triangle Initiative will tell us how to build our economies while conserving the regions and parallel natural resources base. What I'm telling you is that we are in the maze of a grand undertaking, and I invite each and every one of you and the business community to take part in it. This is not only a matter of conserving the environment, it is also a great way to ensure the well-being and prosperity of the local coastal communities. The concepts of sustainable growth with equity, which I would like to believe is one of universal significance, would be a utopia unless all the stakeholders work together. This is why I always urge my government to actively work with business and the NGOs and all those who share our common goal. And I also hope that business people and environmentalists can enhance their collaboration. They talk to one another instead of talking past one another. Within your conversations lie the answers to our global problems and challenges. Environment and business do not constitute a threat of zero-sum game. In Indonesia, we have instances where the development of palm oil plantation goes hand in hand with conservation of endangered species. For example, there is a positive collaboration recently established to conserve orangutans by Sinarmas, a large Indonesian plantation company, and Dr. Biruti Galdikas, the international activist icon for orangutans protection. We were happy to have facilitated that collaboration. The other example is the more difficult effort to conserve the few surviving Sumatran tigers as their habitat is encroached upon by human economic activities. Large private companies collaborated to create sanctuaries for the tigers. Again, all this simply means doing the right thing, taking the calculated risk, and to, pra to be pragmatic and avoid being dogmatic in pursuing our common goals. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, let us think outside the box. Let us not be stuck with old and timid ideas. 
when circumstances demand it, let us not let the perfect be enemy of the good. Let us find ways by which we can serve the cause of sustainable development together and thus prosper together. I therefore call on you to join hands with Indonesia and build a strong partnership among the business community, civil society, and my government. Let that partnership work through the development of wise and sportive policies, investment and financing, technology sharing, and capacity building. And I am confident that it will work. It will make us all prosperous. It will also reassure us that we have done what is right for the planet we live on, the teeming million whose life and livelihood depended, I should say, depend on the environment and future generation of humankind. I thank you.